another episode of the Dawson Grant Academy Talk Show. My name is Dawson Grant, a three-time Olympian, former board director of London 2012 Big Team. Each week, me and my guests explore the mindset, determination, and focus it takes to become an elite. Gain the insight to the world of sports, film, and more. Welcome to the next episode of Dalton Grant Academy Talk Show. And I'd like to say, have a, a wonderful treat for you today. Our special guest today is none other than an England international, you know, a Liverpool legend, Mr. John Barnes. I'd like to say, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Um, but you forgot ex England international because, of course, if you look at the size of me now. No. In my eyes, you're current. Through the legends. Yeah, some <laughs> people never even reach the level that you've reached. So, hey, you're still current to me. <laughs> thank you. But anyway, um, John, um, thank you. Thank you so much for, um, you know, accepting the invite to the show. And let's go into it, John. So, your youth, football, was it athletics? Was it cricket? Tell me, what in, and well, who inspired you? I grew up in Jamaica um, till I was 13 years old. So, of course, growing up in Jamaica, my father played football for Jamaica. He was, a, he was a colonel in the army, so he wasn't a professional footballer. But, of course, being a colonel in the army, he was a very good footballer. He was a very good cricketer. He played cricket for Trinidad, funnily enough. He, he came from Trinidad to Jamaica when he was 19 to join the British West Indies Regiment because anybody from any of the Caribbean islands who wanted to join the army had to go to Jamaica. So from Trinidad and Barbados, he had to go to Jamaica. So he played cricket for Trinidad second eleven when he was 18 years old. But when he came to Jamaica, he always played football. When he got to 26, 27, he's an army officer. He then became the, the, the Jamaican football team captain, plays as a centre-back. He came to Sandhurst in the, um, in the 50s, which is obviously the officer, British officer training camp, where all of Winston Churchill and all of these great army people went. Not Winston, he was a politician. But he was, uh, he was there with um, Andrew Parker Bowles, Camilla's husband. Camilla Parker Bowles, his husband. So he was a British army officer. Uh, and he then became, he played rugby for Sandhurst, never played rugby before. He became the heavyweight boxing champion at Sandhurst because my dad, being a very disciplined person, decided that, and he knows what discrimination is like and the perception that they will have of, these are like the elite of the British Army, which has been around for hundreds of years, who are now having to accept colonials into the ranks coming into, so therefore he felt he had to volunteer for everything. He had to be better than them. So he volunteered to box, play rugby, everything. So I grew up in a very sporting household. So growing up in Jamaica, as much as football was always my first choice, I played cricket. I didn't play rugby because rugby wasn't in Jamaica, but my, I had to walk across Sabina Park every day to go to school. My school, St. George's College, was attached to Sabina Park, the home of Jamaican West Indies cricket, if you like. So I grew up playing cricket. Then coming to England, I played rugby because I went to a rugby school. So like my dad said, whatever you're going to do, you throw yourself into it. So I only played rugby at school in England. I played football for a local club, a so boys club but I only played rugby at school. So I really just did all sports. Yes. But it was always going to be football. Yeah. So it's, you come from a sporting background. So did you feel the pressure? So it's really great looking back as a youth, you had someone to look up to, a role model, which is your dad. Um, did you feel the pressure from your parents that once they knew what you loved, was they strict? Was they quite laid back to that approach? No, my father was very strong in saying that. I didn't feel, I didn't feel the pressure in having to succeed. I felt the pressure and having to do my best because he said, if you're going to do something, you do it with integrity, you do it with honesty, you do it with discipline and commitment. Just to give you an example of how committed my father believed you had to be to be a human being, forget about sport, education was the same as much as I didn't listen too much to that, but my sisters did, was I was swimming competitively. My sister swam for Jamaica and my other sister played, she played squash for Jamaica. So it was a really sporting household. She swam for Jamaica when she was 11 years old in the age group on the 11th, on the 12th. And I was swimming competitively for Marlin Swim Club. So we had to go to training every day at the National Stadium in Jamaica. I don't know if you've run there. Because we live where you've jumped there. We've lived right we, up our camp where we were brought up the army base. was right beside to it. So we used to walk across the football field to go to swimming training every single day. 
because I was a competitive swimmer at six, seven, eight years old. But I used to stop off to play football with my friends and then go to training every day. And my dad said, if you're not going to go to swimming training every day to be committed, stop swimming. So I gave up my swimming career when I was about 10 years old, <laughs> nine years old, because he said, if you're going to do it, you do it with integrity and honesty. Yeah. So therefore, the point I'm trying to make is the pressure I felt was if I was going to do something, you do it with authenticity and commitment. Yes. But you know the funny thing about it, John? My parents were from Jamaica, Kingston and St. Thomas license. And my mom couldn't swim because it was, I yeah. don't know, it was a fear of, you know, you might lose Kingston your life in the water or a lot of people probably passed away. So it was really funny. And when I was growing up, it was known that black people couldn't swim because their bones was heavy. So to hear you go back in your youth and you're, you know, inside to say, hey, I was good at swimming, you know? So, but Dalton, Dalton, once again, we're talking about now, we're talking about the perception that people have of other groups of people. That's yes. where discrimination, sexism, homophobia comes from. There was a perception that black people don't swim. That's right. Black people slam all over. And once again, once we have these perceptions, which are forced on us, we are conditioned to think it, then we can't help it. So that is why racists, homophobes, we can't help it because this is what we have been wrongly taught about each other. So you were wrongly taught that black people don't swim because the bones are heavy, so therefore your mom didn't swim. That's not true. And this is what we have to challenge. We have to challenge what we've learned. <laughs> Not the way we actually act. Challenge what we've learned. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a great insight because it shows that your family foundation, um, education was, you know, number one on agenda. Talent was second, it seemed like. Um, so these are the things. What do you believe, like, young kids nowadays, you know, should look up first? Is it education? What happens if they're not academic and they are small? What, well, that's the what can that's you give now to the youth? Obviously, that's, the, that, that's the, the, the million dollar question. That's the dilemma we have because we want our children and we're looking for a role model for our children. Now, yes. I was fortunate because my environment, being from a middle class Jamaican family, whose family started the first Jamaican government, my great -grandf my grandfather and his brothers, alongside Michael Manley and Alexander Bustamante, they started the PNP. So therefore, from a middle class elite Jamaican family who was fortunate enough to be able to have a good schools and be able to do sport. So it's fine to look at me as an example and say, I did it. But I was fortunate that I had that nurturing as a youngster. Now, why I'm loath to really go into the inner city to tell these kids what to do, because when, they say, when I say to them, look, I'm not a good example because I was given every privilege and benefit to be able to do what I did. You may not have that benefit. You know, yes. So I look at someone like Ian Wright, for example, who would have come from there and say, okay, well, look at Ian and what he's actually done. You know, and he's come from where you've come from, yeah. all the struggles that you've had from an educational point of view, from the point of view of with his family and, you know, the way he lived and, the, and the, where he lived. Okay. So a big problem I have when we talk about going into the inner cities to talk about, you know, being in, inspirational and seeing, not just me, but even Ian Wright or other people who have come from that area, um, the, 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 why I'm low sometimes to do that is because Ian Wright and, and Stormzy and all the people have come through to achieve what they've achieved, achieved despite their environment, despite the negativity towards them, despite the fact that they didn't have any opportunities because they were brilliant people. Yeah. Now, what we want to do is we want to create an opportunity and an environment for you not to have to be better than everybody else and have to be strong and have to be for you to be successful. So yeah. what I try and do is to try and say, let us create an environment which is not just going to produce the Ian Wright and the Stormzy's and the brilliant people, for the average person to get equality, to get respect, to be able to get a job, to be able to get a decent house, rather than saying, you have to be better than white people, or you have to be better than somebody else to achieve. I understand that, yeah, that's very inspirational to people, but that doesn't affect 99% of people. Because 99% of people can't be footballers, boxers, high jumpers, rappers. 99% of people are going to be average people, regardless. Yeah, but so why don't we try and, try and create an environment to help those average people who can't be the superstars? That's yeah, no, what's more important. I agree, John. I mean, it's very good. I come from a, uh, um, a privileged um, upbringing, coming from Hackney, so-called the ghetto. But I can tell you now, my parents was, a, my mom was a cook, my dad was a carpenter, but I could have gone a different way. I'm proud of myself that people knew me and what I was capable of doing, but I did the right thing. When I had my choice, I did the right thing. So I've not, I can be proud here and tell you, I did not end up in prison. I didn't get myself in trouble. When it was to do the wrong thing, I went the other directions. First, my parents, I didn't want to let them down. Secondly, I was scared of the licks. So. <laughs> That's the only thing but I've you were also, But Dalton, you were also fortunate because you had the talent and the height and the, and the physical capability to be a world-class high jumper. Yeah, now, no, but said, this is what I'm saying. I had the talent and ability, but I wanted to be a football player. But my talent right. lied in jumping. But I commend okay. myself for having that yeah. mindset and realizing, you know, where my talent lied and actually nurture that by putting myself right. around the right people. 
So what I'm trying yeah. to do now with the Dalton Rock Academy is listen, the man behind John Barnes. John Barnes is your vision, your upbringing, what you portray. Is it the majority who live that lifestyle as yours? Or is it someone like Ian Wright, Dalton, Rio Ferdinand, David Beckham? And this is what we need to do. But it's not the lifestyle. right way is it's the, the way what suits you, you know, and invited by the law and being yeah, strong enough to say no at the right time. And don't get pressured by peer pressure. You know, and this is what I believe it's great to meet you and get to know you and you're so passionate with what you're, you're delivering. And I commend you for going out and speaking like that because there's a lot of people that might not understand where you're coming from. Understand, get to know John Barnes because you know, know the foundation of where it's going. And you don't need to agree with him, but if you don't, you have to agree with what he's doing. He's standing up and being out in public, you know, for what you believe in. And I commend you for that, John. If no one said it, I'm saying here. And I take bits and pieces. I don't need to agree with everything, but I take a lot from you. You inspired me on the pitch and you inspire me, you know, after sport. You know, what you're doing, what you stand. So it's great that foundation that you nurtured you for your parents, through education, going through football and using your skills, transverbal skills. So as again, once again, I commend you, John Barnes. So Thank you very let's much, go on Dalton. to the next. No, but one second, Dalton. Any role models, Dalton, Dalton, Sorry, Dalton. let's come back. Yeah, Dalton, just let, just let me make one point about that. You want to yes, be a to make a point about that. Yeah, go you, you want to be a footballer. And as much yes. as you would say, yeah, you could have been, it didn't work out. Other people may disagree, but it didn't work out. But you fortunately had the talents to be a, a jumper. Yes. Now, what about if you want to be a footballer? You want to be a jumper. You want to be a boxer. You want to be a singer. But you can't because you haven't got the talent, of which 99% of people don't. Then you become an official or agent. And be honest no, you're, to yourself. An official or an agent? How are you going to become an official or an agent when you can't even no, get a GCSE because, because you cannot even get an education because the inner city doesn't give you a house where you can have lights, doesn't give you an education? How are you going to do that? How are you going to do that? We can't say to our kids, people who become that, become those great things despite their environment. Definitely, thing but is, John, yes, you can aspire to do that. This is what I'm saying, John. I love what you're saying. But we are the, yeah. you are the pioneer, John. I am the pioneer. So therefore, we have to make it easier for the next generation. But the no, next but, generation but needs to know that it's not that we're out of tune or out of date. We're talking from experience. Experience. Yes, we but, know what it takes. The hours, not tonight, the years Dalton. went into this. And this is what I'm Dalton. trying to do now with the Dalton. show to hear what John Barnes is saying and how he's making a difference. Right. But that is not the reality for 99% of people. Whatever, any kid that you empower to become a footballer or to become whatever he wants to become, that is going to be less than 2% of the population. What happens to the others? And that's what I'm talking John, about. John, we let's be honest, John. Environment. John, you're in a world that if you go to war, you're going to have casualties. Yeah? Yeah. You play a team, someone has to lose. So that's life. So but this Dalton, is what life is. Dalton. It's a gamble. But the, the thing what it is, the key is, make sure you're at peace with yourself and you're honest and you can do the right thing and sleep at night. You can't please everyone. What Dalton. you've got, John Barnes is not gonna press the button and make the world be one special place. That's what's so beautiful about the world. It's all yep. individuals, it's all right. ups and downs, it's a roller coaster, and it's how you survive, you know, in life. And raising your Dalton. family, you know, doing the basic things. Or looking Dalton. after yourself if you don't want to have a family. Dalton. It's down to every Dalton. individual. Dalton, we don't want 99% of people to lose. Yes, we know <laughs> it's right. hard, but 99% of people are losing. And the 1% of black people are winning, and we're then saying that's okay. That's not okay. It's no, that's not okay, not okay for John Barnes totally and Dalton. Agree. We need to get yes. it. And 99% of people are being neglected. And I'm not going to neglect them, regardless of whether we feel that we need more footballers and actors and, 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 and pop stars and, and agents, that is for 1%. We need the 99% to be re represented. And what Marcus Rashford did, and I'm, that's not a black thing, but that's an underprivileged thing, underprivileged right. thing of which most black people are. What he did was he changed the lives of underprivileged people by lobbying the government and the council to do something about it. What he could have done was given them £250,000 of his own money, which have lasted one week. That, and right. that's what we're being told. Let black man give some money. No, let us use our platform to lobby the government, the councils, to do good. When Raheem Sterling gives 250 cup final, semi-final tickets to people in Stonebridge Park, bad knife crime area in London, he should take those 250 kids into a press conference and say they're not being given any education, any access to social care, any housing, no opportunities. That's going to help them. 250 cup final tickets or semi-final tickets is not going to help them. It'll happen for one day. 
And that is what we, as the leaders, as the elite, should be talking about. What's going yeah, on for 99% of people. Definitely. But that's why I say, at the end of the day, we have to get our house in order. And it's all about experience. And Absolutely. I commend him, uh, Marcus Rashford, as I said yourself. They can only do what they know, John. They're still, he's still young. He's still growing. And at least he's doing something. You know, the first person doing a, that, that a a starts for me was Lennox Lewis. You know, many years ago, he tried to invest in um, a college um, in Brookhouse in Hackney. So that's someone that has put back and used his yeah. own money. So yeah. that's another pioneer what went on. But what I'd like now, John, going back, in, back, switching back, we know you're passionate about life and, you know, the black race and people in a whole, because, you know, people in a whole. Um, so let's go back. How did you handle... Um, pressure when you was young in sports of the performance and what people expected from John Barnes? How I handled it was what I expected of myself. And I expected 100% commitment, attitude, not always going to do, you, you, you could miss an open goal, you could play badly, you can do whatever you're going to do. But I put pressure on myself to maximize my potential. And if I did that, then nobody could put pressure on me to do any more because I could only do what I did as well as I could to my ability. And if that was enough, then that's enough. And I'll give you an example. So if I'm going to race Usain Bolt, I'm not going to say you because you can beat me. And John Barnes in his prime. John Barnes in his, in his prime in 100 meters, 11.2, let's say, for example. 11.3. That's for me. Usain Bolt is 9.4. If I race Usain Bolt and I do 11.4 and Usain Bolt beats me by 20 yards, but he does 10.5, I am more successful than him because I've maximized my potential to do exactly what I can do, whereas he's done a second slower. So as much as he's won the race, I am the winner. And all you can do- That's in your eyes, person. John. I like no, that. But, second. but you're no, not no. going to win the gold medal unless you ah. pass the line first. <laughs> ah, but unfortunately, only one person can pass the line first. So does everybody That's else right. fail? Does everybody else fail? Yeah. No, they don't. Second place is the first no. loser. That's what no, we no, know, no, John. One second. You have to know the rules no. of the sports. That's that it's like not, when you go that, into football. You, have, you might life. be very skill, skillful and talented, but you need yeah. to know how to play in a formation. But that is not life, Dalton, because you can only have one winner, and if you have one winner, it doesn't mean everybody else has lost, because everybody can't be the best. Everybody can be the best they can be. No, but we know yeah. that, but you know what? It's sports. Sports, you have to be the best. I'm not talking about no, life. No, but you can't I'm talking about a village sports, or raise a family, second. and for the truth second. has to be told to inspire right. the next generation. Because if the lies being told and they're not, you know, thinking clearly and they're doing the wrong things, then it's down to us as the teachers and the pioneers. So right. um, you can't so, put, sport is a part of life. Right, so listen. You know? so, so what is the point of even turning off at the 100 meter final when you know you can't do 9.4 when Usain Bolt can? Because Usain you know you Bolt can't. might, because remember, as a sports right. person, ah. you know, you wake yeah. up, you might have an injury because you push right. yourself in training. Your head okay. might be not right because you might okay. be having problems with your girlfriend. So okay. I was going there. My motto was, when they mess up, I brush up. Sometimes okay. if I went through the ranking, I would not even be in the final. I wouldn't even want a medal. But because I believe that it's a new day and anything could happen on this day, and I don't yeah. know if, for instance, the Johnny Barnes that we know, the skills he has, the tenacity that he has to do damage is going to be that Johnny Barnes to this day. Yeah? On that, on that day, I should say. So this right. is what we're looking at. Okay. So what you're actually saying is that you're hoping for him to fail. Because yeah. you know you can't run as fast as he can. So you're not saying, I'm going to run faster than him because I can't. What I know is if he runs okay. slower... If he I runs understand slower, what you're saying, Johnny. One second, if he runs slower, I'm going to maximize my potential and I'm going to win. So but you're you not see, saying I understand that you're, what you're, gonna, saying. you're better than him. But and that's what life is. Yes, maximizing Johnny. Maximizing your I potential. Understand. Yes, I understand and what you're that saying. He doesn't. Definitely. I understand what you're saying. Sometimes you need to understand not the fastest person always wins the race. I was trained alongside Linford Christie. He was never the fastest. The Americans always ran faster than Linford Christie in yeah. the year. But yeah. his presence and he intimidated you. That's why he became the Olympic champion in 1992. And this is what I'm trying to say. If yeah, but we thought it. that way of Usain Bolt is not fast, and then nobody would turn up. That means eh, the best exactly. would be racing against themselves. So no one should really um, play against Cristiano Ronaldo or Messi no, 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 because no, no, they no. haven't got the no. ability. No, you don't. Because what you do is you say, I am going to maximize my potential. And if he falls short, my potential will win. 
That's okay. what it is. So all That's so you I mean. focus. So you don't focus on him. You focus on yourself doing the best that you can. And hope that's that he right. doesn't do the best he can. And that's what I'm making. You can't do any more than maximizing your potential. You cannot overachieve. When Leicester wow. won the league, it's not because they overachieved. They maximized your potential. And Liverpool, Arsenal, Manchester United, Tottenham underachieved. That's why they won. So you can't be focused on, oh, I want to beat him. And yeah, you can say, well, I hope that he pulls a muscle. Or I hope he doesn't run well. But all you can focus is on, I have to do my best. And then whatever, whatever he does, I have no control over what he does. No, but I'm hoping that he fails. Well said. Well said, John. And that's why loving the passion in you that understands why you were so successful in adversity. And these are the things what people need to see, John. Now, my, there's many ways to skin a cat, but make sure you choose the right way. You have been very, very successful in your field. I've been very successful in my field. World-class players, world-class high jumper. And this is the difference what I love because... It's the right way what suits John Barnes and the way what suits me. And this is what we need them to understand, see us, how we interact, and we do respect one another because you inspired me. That is it. To jump because I had my role to play as, you know, a black athlete. We always inspired one another. And it's nice that, you know, at this stage in our life, I'm only 22, mind you. Yeah, <laughs> no, 54, that I can actually go back right, listen, and have a, a conversation to, to, to know you know, what Johnny Barnes went through. And that's why I want to know, how did you really handle that racism, John? Because I've experienced it. Now I want to know, how did you really feel? Not what you put out, how did you really handle it? How do you feel about racist people? It never bothered me one iota because I didn't feel inferior to them. I felt superior to them because I know that I'm a fully empowered human being. Now Dalton, once again, what did I tell you about growing up in Jamaica? I grew up yes. in Jamaica as an empowered youngster in a middle-class family, an elite family who were the elite in Jamaica. And what, as a light-skinned, thin-lipped Jamaican, did I feel about dark-skinned Jamaicans from the, because of what I was wrongly told in terms of the, 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 okay. the way I've been brought up to condition? So did I look at the black people in Trenchtown and did I feel superior to them? Yes, I did. Because life wrongly told me that being light-skinned, being middle-class, being from an elite family, I'm superior to them. So it's not just a black and a white thing. It's also a class thing. It's also a color thing, as we know. So when I came to England and then people started to racially abuse me, I'm like, well, you can't be talking about me because I feel as empowered as you. So how are you feeling superior to me when I'm doing what I'm doing? I've got the education. I'm intelligent. I'm, my family are who they are. And you are some little boy on the dome. Or you you're white. You can't even get a job and spell your own name. And you're trying to disenfranchise me and make me feel inferior because you're calling me black. It never bothered me at all. So... Once again, I could never look at anybody else, Ian Wright or Luther, anybody who is upset and they fought against it and say, you're wrong to yeah, do that. Yeah. You have to be true no, to yourself. No, I, I understand because let's be honest, at our time, we couldn't walk off. We knew that there was racist people. We knew they made those comments. If we walked off at that time, there'd be no John Barnes. There'd be no Dawson Grant. So our time, we had to suck it up, go out there and perform to the best of our ability. And look, we haven't got a chip on our shoulders because we're balanced. Maybe we have two chips, who knows? But no, but let's go into this, John. What was your best team that, you know, you would say, or performance, I should say, because obviously you played for Liverpool and through. So what was the team that you really thoroughly enjoyed to be playing with? I mean, it was Liverpool. Watford, of course, as well, because that's my first club. Yes. And of course, you know, you're young. Graham Taylor was a great inspiration, a great leader, and you're young and you're playing, so it's a great time. But when I went to Liverpool, I went to a different level. And then I learned about humility. I learned about... I learned about humility at Watford. I learned about togetherness and okay, team spirit. Okay, John, because Watford... break that down. Let's break it down. How did you learn about that? It's well, easy first of all, it came... it, how? Well, first of all, it came from a family. My dad, okay. as I said, my dad spoke about discipline, organization, determination. My father played team sports. And team sports is not about the individual. It is about the group. And the group success, no individual can get success without the group. So in football, from as a young boy, if I scored three goals every match and we lost 4-3, I was a failure because I lost. Right. Yes, I'm the one scoring the goal, but I have lost. So I had that attitude of the team being the most important thing if you're going to be involved in team sports. And even in individual sports, you have to understand that. Because your trainer, your masseuse, your high jump training partners, they're part of your team who are going to help you to win and you have to value them. So no man's an island. There's no such thing as an individual who does everything by himself. Your masseuse, yes. you have to massage you, all that kind of stuff. So I understood that. What you understand that. Really? that? Because Watford didn't have any superstar players. Every player came from the fourth division, Luther included. When I came as a young boy, I was a 17, 18-year-old, not a superstar boy. I came into this team who finished second to Liverpool in the league without having superstar players. How do we do that? Because of our attitude towards the team. 
Then I went to Liverpool. Of course, they're superstar players. They're the best team in the country, the best team in Europe. But the players still bought into this ideology, which is a very socialist ideology from Bill Shankly, of the team being the most important thing. What is a team? Not the first 11, the whole squad. Not the whole squad, the staff. Not just the staff, the fans. Not just the fans, the tea lady. The people who are the groundsmen. That's the family that gives success. And that's what we buy into. Right. And that is what a community is. So Definitely. the success of any individual, the success of you, me, Stormzy, that comes from our community supporting us and, 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 and yeah. winning us on. And that is what I believe. So that is why I talk about humility. And yeah. that's what Liverpool had. Brilliant. So, John, it sounds like you're the complete package, but did you have any weaknesses? Come on, John, give me insight. What did you have to battle with? With your challenges? We all any have battles, weaknesses. any challenges? Training we all hard, have... waking up, I don't, I don't see eating them as, properly. I don't see... I don't see them as weaknesses or challenges. I see them as, okay. as, as being human, as being human. Of course I erred and I failed and I could have done things better. But what you have to do is you have to give 100%. John, like, what could you have done better, John? What could you have done better? Well, I could have um, stayed in and not gone out as much as I did. I could have been more professional. But don't forget, <laughs> this is the 80s when the, the attitude of going out and having a good time rather than living the professional life that they live now. Um, obviously, in my first marriage, I could have been a better husband. So, so you're a better mover, John. Better. John, huh? you've got the moves, John. I used to, not anymore. So um, were you a soul yeah. boy, reggae, yeah, yeah, no, 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 yeah, of course. Your, your R&B, music? R&B, hip-hop, R&B, hip-hop, grandma, oh. that's in a few years, five. So no, you no, got no, them, no, them moves, John, yeah? Like you know the Pee Wee Herbit back in the days, John? You know the yeah, moves? I can, listen, I can do all of that. What's the matter with oh. you? Right? Pop, please, come on. You from Hackney. You must know, um, you must know the Fontaines. You know the Fontaines? From Bow. Yeah. I don't know if you know the Fontaines. They were dancers. Yeah, the yeah. Oh, yeah. I yeah. do, so yeah, I used yeah, to go yeah. to, to Hunter Club and I used to see and so forth. All the soul clubs in London I used to go to when I first came in the late 70s. Anyway, but the point I'm making is that what I try to do is maximize my potential so I could do lots of things better. And there were people who are better than me, people who are worse than me, and I did as well as I could. I couldn't wish to do, I could wish to be a better professional and do more, but I then could look at Maradona and compete with him and say, yeah, I'm going to be better than him. I could be as good as I can be to its maximum, and that's all I focused on. Brilliant. Well, John, we're nearly coming to the end of this. And I'd just like to say, if you had a magic wand, tell me two things what you would do to make difference. Only two things, short, please, quick and direct. The first thing I'd want everybody to see everybody as equal, regardless of whether you're a woman, gay or black. And the second thing is to be born 20 years ago, which means I'm a 20-year-old footballer where I'm signing a contract for £500,000 a week. Come on, wow. please. <laughs> I was the first <laughs> £10,000 a week. Dalton, I was the first £10,000 a week player in the country. 500 grand a year. When I signed for Liverpool, my second contract, and people went, the world's gone mad. How can you pay a player that much? £10,000 a week, and I felt 10 grand a week. Now they're earning 500 grand a week. <laughs> wow. Well, <John. laughs> and you know what happened? People said to me, oh, you're never going to get it this good. You know, all the players who played in the 70s and 60s were saying, oh, we were born at the wrong time. Now is the best time ever. You're never going to have it this good. Look at it now. <laughs> I know. I'd like to say, on behalf of me and the viewers, Johnny Barnes, a legend, as we know. Thank you so much. And pleasure. And carry on and keep on inspiring people. Thank you very much, Dalton. All the best.